I'm your host, Eric Eisenberg. Welcome to Hero Blend number 65. This week, Marvel officially announced that actor Tom Holland and director John Watts had both signed on to make the brand new Spider Man movie. On this week's episode, we're going to talk about all of our expectations for the brand new film, so check it out. Welcome back, everyone. I am super stoked to have once again on the show for this very important episode, Mr. Sean O'Connell from Cinema Blend. How's it going, bud? You only use me for Spider-Man stuff. <laughs> I have other interests, Eric. But you are my Spider-Man guy. I know that this news is going to excite you probably more than any person I know. So I want, I want your input, man. You can't, can't blame me for that. I wrote a massive column laying out the three reasons why now is a very good time to be a Spider-Man fan. Optimism abounds. Exactly. And uh, so, as we said in the intro, we are going to discuss uh, the kind of six things that we really want to see uh, from Marvel's Spider-Man reboot now that we know that Tom Holland is going to be uh, starring as Spider-Man, Peter Parker, that John Watts is going to be directing the film. Very exciting times. Um, but we also have a lot of expectations. So, Sean, why don't you hit me with the first thing that you really, really, really want to see out of the uh, Spider-Man Marvel Cinematic Universe movie? Humor. I want a sense of humor from who I always thought is the funniest Marvel hero. Um, and it's it's a very specific type of humor. It's Peter Parker's sarcasm uh, that I think has been a pretty good part of the MCU in characters like Tony Stark and and even, you know, straight-laced folks like Chris Evans, the way that they play Steve Rogers, they, they find humor in all of that. Batman is playing Galaga. Thought we wouldn't notice, but we did. But Spider-Man, and I think you and I have had this discussion before, it could be a straight-up comedy that happens to have um, action elements to it. And I think that maybe they're going that way with Paul Rudd and Ant-Man also. Maybe that'll be a step in this direction. I don't expect things like Doctor Strange or even Black Panther to be humorous. But with Spider-Man, this is their opportunity to just blow the doors off and make a funny hero. And I want to see a funny Peter Parker. I completely agree with you. I mean, like, basically, it seems like through the franchises that we've gotten so far, uh, like, we've gotten hints of the humor and it's kind of increased as it's gone. Like, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man is kind of funny, not super funny. Uh, in, we, then we stepped up to uh, Mark Webb's series which was a little bit more funny, but still not quite there. But I am definitely right there with you. Like, I, I, I want this, I want Spider-Man to essentially be an action comedy. Every single, like, I, I, I'm not every, obviously not every single line out of Peter Parker's mouth should be something funny. But the guy, like, in the comics, he's, I mean, he's not quite Deadpool hilarious, in my opinion. But he, he is constantly throwing barbs. He's having as much fun fighting superheroes as much as much as we are enjoying actually watching him so yes i completely agree on that front okay what's your first point uh my first one is and this it seems kind of obvious just in the idea of introducing a uh new hero to the marvel cinematic universe spider-man's never been able to interact with marvel characters before so what i want to see is really an established hero in the marvel cinematic universe join him in the movie i mean marvel has kind of already shown that they are Show an inclination towards uh, including extra, like outside heroes in different films. I mean, Black Widow obviously uh, came into Captain America: The Winter Soldier, but I think there's so much there's there's so many dynamics that can be played up, especially with a young Spider-Man. That it would be a mistake if Marvel didn't have a established player like play a strong supporting role in this movie. Do you have one in particular that you'd prefer to see? You know, uh, we've heard rumors uh, about Iron Man potentially being there. That's a great mix, if not only because, A, you have the uh, kind of the age difference, which I think is key, just key, because you are dealing with a younger superhero, and you're going with one of the older superheroes in Iron Man. I think Robert Downey Jr. is around 50 years old, so to have that contrast would be fantastic. Uh, Daredevil and Spider-Man obviously have an incredible history in the comics, so and to bring Charlie Cox's Daredevil to the big screen would be spectacular i can't imagine anything less but honestly the really cool thing about it is that it could be anybody simply because if we've learned anything from the history of marvel comics it's that when you bring two characters together they have such different personalities that no matter what you get it's going to be interesting i mean you could you could put scarlet witch in the spider-man movie and just their dynamic her background versus his background they obviously come from two very different places but if you give them a shared mission it could be fascinating and so i i'm really game for kind of any of it i'm second request because they're not going to give daredevil his own movie yet and i think that's an 
awesome way to implement the success that they had in the Netflix show and to pair, because like you said, Daredevil and Spider-Man has some great stories together. So that'd be, that'd be incredible. I completely agree. Um, and, uh, yeah, Daredevil is certainly at the top of my list. Like uh, he's, I mean, it's, if not only because uh, the Charlie Cox Daredevil is just so amazing that I want to see more of him, but yes, like the, like the fact that they're both New York heroes, they're both kind of street level and they, and they have good powers that could be matched up. Uh, I see a lot of potential there. Um, why don't you hit me with your second thing? What are you looking for? All right, second point is I want to see a storyline, and part of this is Sam Raimi tried to incorporate this, but Mark Webb never got it. I want to see a story in place, and it could be just a single told story, a single, you know, one that just goes over the course of this movie, but something that puts Spider-Man in a position where he's facing impossible odds, and he just, there's no way that he can succeed, but he he doesn't know how to quit. Like, that's what I love about Spider-Man is his resilience. Like, and, and the fact that they're casting a young actor leads me to believe that they're going to put him against someone or something that is just out of his class. And Spider-Man, that's to me, that's that's the best, is when he anyone else would be saying, there's no way I can keep going. Whether he's exhausted, you know, physically, emotionally, it's, he's just totally beaten down. And he just keeps pushing on. Because to me, that's uh, integral to the development of the character. And that's why I like him so much. And And it is a lot of that. The humor is born out of him not really knowing how to react to everything that's going on to him. Because so many of these heroes that we're seeing in the DC universe um, are self-confident. They're because of powers that they have. Yeah. And at this young stage with Spider-Man, he doesn't know his powers yet. Like he totally grows into being a confident hero. But right now the core of this is him making mistakes and, and him putting others in danger because of bad decisions that he made. And I want to see that aspect of the character explored because Andrew Garfield I liked him as Peter Parker a lot. I thought he was good as Peter Parker, but he was he had confidence right off the bat. He always struck me as a, a spidey Peter who had swagger, and I don't think young Peter Parker has that. And I want to see him put in some really difficult situations and having to find the courage and the fortitude to rise up and push back against them. You know, I, I absolutely love that too. If not only because, I mean, if not only, you could really make a strong parallel just between the feel, like the feeling when you are young and that you kind of do... That you, there is a degree to which you feel the world is on your shoulders. That you feel mm -hmm. that there is a ton of responsibility out there for you to that you really need to live up to. And you, and you make a point. Like we, we have seen, uh, we we've seen Spider-Man deal with very personal villains up to this point. Uh, people that he's like closely related to. Uh, I mean, it changed. I mean, obviously with like Sam Raimi's Spider-Man Two, uh, with uh, even Venom and Spider-Man Three and Green Goblin, everything. It's very, very close to him. But you're very, you're right. We have not seen him kind of deal solo with a an incident that is way bigger than him. Uh, and I especially agree, it would be fascinating if he was in some part personally responsible for it. Like that, that is something I totally agree with. And again. The fact that Marvel, and, and just to reinforce your point, I completely agree. I, I think the biggest thing that Marvel has done correctly so far is get a young Spider-Man. Like, th that is such an integral part of the character, as I mentioned before, balancing him off of, uh, uh, off of older heroes is going to be a, a very important contrast. And uh, it's just, it's, it's a dynamic that we haven't yet seen, and I completely agree. Those are states that the next movie absolutely needs. Totally. All right, what's your second one? Uh, the second one, I'd say, is probably going to be kind of obvious to most people. Uh, but what it really comes down to is I want to see a villain who we just had not seen in live action before. Uh, Spider-Man, I mean, really getting Spider-Man back, I don't, uh, part of, for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I think it's not even so much important that they get Spider-Man back so much as they get his villains back. Because I, I don't think it's even arguable that uh, Spider-Man's villains are the best uh, in the Marvel universe. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, it's hard to say because even reading a list that we just did recently on the site about villains that we want to see in them, some of them just strike me as cheesy. They work really well on the page. Someone like Scorpion or, or even Vulture, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw the Rhino converted and it didn't work. And, and I kind of, there's, I don't know, there's not a lot of ways that you can do those now without making them seem cheesy. You know, I, I think that, I mean, I, I agree that Scorpion is probably, I mean, I, I, I have him on the list uh, that I came up in preparation for this show. But yes, he is one of the cheesier heroes. But at the same time, you have like heroes like the Chameleon, who is like this organized crime boss who can turn into anybody. And right. honestly, what you could do with the movie is have the entire thing set up that 
uh, Spidey's thinking that he's facing one villain, but no, he's actually facing the chameleon instead and just had no idea this entire time. I think that's an amazing thing. Uh, I, I think another great one uh, that was actually hinted at in Amazing Spider-Man 2 and kind of the future of what would have been Sinister Six is Kraven. Uh, the fact that Marvel isn't going with the origin story, that they're going with uh, an established version of this hero, um, means that you can Im immediately uh, kind of introduce Kraven as a player, simply because maybe he heard uh, about uh, Spider-Man and he decided, yes, he is the ultimate game to uh, right. hunt and kill. And yeah, you bring him in that way. I think that, that t Marvel taking the shortcut and avoiding the origin story is by far the biggest move. But what I love about it is the fact that it can open its door up to uh, villains like Kraven. Another great one is uh, Black Cat, uh, yeah. who, again, we've seen hinted at, uh, was originally going to be a part of uh, Spider -Man, uh, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4. Haven't seen it yet, but the idea of uh, Spider-Man having a relationship uh, on with his, Superman, with his superhero personality as opposed to Peter Parker, that's fascinating. And, so, and again, something that you can really touch on uh, just using the youth of the character. Uh, th there are so many options. At this point, reusing villains, I just think is a monumental mistake. I, I, like, to have a central villain that like Dr. Octopus or uh, even Electro or Green Goblin, great as they are, important as they are, you don't want them off the bat. I think those guys need to kind of stay in a closet for a little bit while, maybe hint at them a little, but for the most part, stay away from them. Well, the only thing I would argue is if they told me that D'Onofrio's Kingpin was going <laughs> to be the focus of the movie, and this is why, if they're not going to give us the, the Peter Parker origin and I don't want it, you know, they're going to say he's established already. You could use Kingpin and you've used an entire season of a Daredevil, you know, series to establish him as a threat in an area where we know Spider-Man exists. It'll be two seasons by the time we, I mean, two seasons potentially. We don't know if Kingpin's going to be part of Daredevil season two. But yeah, two seasons leading into uh, his, his appearance in that movie. Dude, potentially. Then you can do Punisher and Kingpin and, and that, that untitled Spider-Man will be the best MCU movie to date. I tell you, guaranteed. <laughs> But I think then you're going to have people begging that Spider-Man goes to the Marvel Netflix series just so that you get hours and hours and hours of Spider-Man. Yeah, Which, I, know. I mean, you know, would I complain about that? No. But, uh, <laughs> yes, but that, I think that is certainly uh, a segment of it. Uh, hit me with your point three, Sean. All right, point three. Kind of talks a bit about what you were just saying, but I do think that at some point in the movie, they need to hint at the existence of, uh, existence of Norman Osborn. Yeah. In this way. Uh, Green Goblin is, you know, the quintessential Spider-Man villain. He is the Joker to Batman. He's Lex Luthor to Superman. And one of the most memorable points of the entire Nolan Batman trilogy to me is, is just the simple card flip at the end of Batman Begins that just says there's a threat out there, you know, and you have to deal with it kind of thing. And I don't want to see Norman, and I don't even need to see Norman for a few movies, but if you just let me know this is how he's out there and and event like it's like the promise of all right great we're going to get to see tom holland go against his version of norman osborn but but also just because norman has played such a larger part in a lot of things of what it seems that marvel wants to do in phase 3 too so if you tell me you know that they're going to cast a norman and he's going to play a bigger impact not just in the upcoming spider-man movie but beyond because you know we start looking at phase 4 and and unless Marvel's pulling off some some blockbuster deal to get Doctor Doom back, uh, they're going to need villains. You know, they're going to need some really powerful, uh, overreaching villains. And and Norman, to me, is someone then who has to be part of the long-term plan. I honestly, you make, I, I, I do agree. Uh, Norman, like Green Goblin, Norman needs to exist in this universe. I think he is a necessary piece. Again, he should not uh, be necessarily introduced. But the point you make about uh, just Norman in general, I mean, he's also the guy who organized the Dark Avengers and the Thunderbolts. Like, this, he has a larger role in the Marvel Universe that could be easily played up to extreme degrees and create something awesome. Like, mm -hmm. I, even just, I mean, yes, the, the, like, you want the central conflict between Norman Osborn to be with Spider-Man simply because that is the nature of the character. But yes, you're right. I think Norman Osborn is a character who not only plays an important role in Spider-Man's life, but a critical role in the history of the Marvel Universe. And to uh, you, you can't ignore him completely. You need some kind of presence. Uh, obviously, Mark Webb's Amazing Spider-Man 2 kind of prevents Oscorp from uh, still having the same kind of presence that uh, it did. Uh, I, I think you maybe want to acknowledge that it exists, 
you don't you definitely don't want it to have the same kind of overarching influence that it had on the previous movies. Well, uh, because, and like, even though even though Webb's movies are going to be wiped off the the existence, it, it eliminates the need for them to have to do the Gwen Stacy story because fans can at least say we saw it, you know, and, and we're not going to be looking for for this new Peter to experience that loss. You know, so you can bring Norman in and go in a different direction with him, which is what the MCU is going to need Norman to do. That leads me into uh, my third point, actually rather perfectly, which is that we've now seen, uh, we've seen Mary Jane, we've seen Kristen Dunn's Mary Jane from Sam Raimi's movies, we've seen uh, Emma Stone's version of Gwen Stacy, and yes, we did kind of see Mary Jane and Gwen Stacy uh, in, coexist in Spider-Man 3, but I really want uh, the new movie to show these two characters coexisting. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, that is a very important, especially because uh, this, you're dealing with a high school Peter Parker. That has always been the conflict between the existence of and the like draw between both uh, Gwen Stacy and Mary Jane has been something that's been a, been a part of the comics for decades. And the fact that comics have not taken advantage of that, I'm sorry, the movies have not taken advantage of the, that yet is just, it's a, it's a door wide open in my opinion. No, it's true. And both previous existing franchises have struggled to come up with ways to have the two characters coexist. When Raimi went heavy with Mary Jane to start off with, he botched how to bring in one. He didn't really know how to do it. And, you know, with Webb, I knew, we knew that Shailene Woodley was cast as Mary Jane, and then he sort of realized it wasn't working in his already bloated <laughs> sequel. And so, yeah, if you introduce, um, you know, the animated versions of Spider-Man recently were talking about different ways that the two of those characters existed with Peter, um, helping him, uh, putting him in some difficult situations. And this is a good opportunity for Marvel pulling the hero into the MCU to have those three core characters and people like Flash Thompson also, and even a young Harry Osborn, I wouldn't be opposed to seeing a young Harry cast in there too. He's kind of kind of important if they're gonna bring him in at that point. So yeah, yeah these it, are really important characters. It, it, it's, it's basically just part of like establishing a young Spider-Man. And yes, uh, I mean, Mark Webb's uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2 does take the death of Gwen Stacy off the table for at least a little while, but you know, you give it some distance, you give it some time, you establish this new Gwen Stacy as her own kind of person. And especially that relationship, uh, like just in contrast with uh, the relationship we can see with Mary Jane. And if you see those kind of relationships developing at the same time, like it, it's interesting, you could create a situation where fans are wondering uh, whether, who Spider-Man should, well, should be with, will be with, either way, like it, it's, it, it, it adds an interesting dynamic to the relationship that, which you definitely want Spider-Man, it's always been such an important part of the character that you need it there, and having both of them actually play a very key role from a, like, from a very young age for Spider-Man is something we haven't seen in the movies yet, and something I absolutely want to say. Well, and what gives me the most confidence is that it's Marvel making the creative decisions. And I'm not trying to crap all over what Sony did because I'm a fan of what they did. Um, I happen to like what Mark Webb was doing with Oscorp. But if you're telling me that Kevin Feige and the creative guys at Marvel are making the ultimate decisions on all of these points that we just brought up, because there's, there's six very important points. Uh, yeah, in Marvel currently, I trust because they've made, even when they tweak things, they tend to tweak them for the right reasons. And if we don't necessarily get exactly what we thought we wanted out of all of these choices, I think what we get are going to be, you know, things building towards a bigger picture. Absolutely. And uh, I think that's a great place to leave it. Uh, Sean, thanks again for uh, being on the show, man. It was great talking Spider-Man with you again. And uh, I'm sure that there will be more Spider-Man episodes to come for you to be a co-host on. So. I want to know who May is. Who's going to be Aunt May now? <laughs> <laughs> Thank I you. Always, always a pleasure. Maybe you go a little older than, uh, yeah, that's a whole other show. <laughs> we'll do that further down the line. We'll, we'll dedicate an entire episode to who Aunt May should be. Uh, again, Sean, thank you so much. And uh, everyone else, I will see you next week. Have a good one.